Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to receive testimony from General Glenn Van Herc, Commander of the United States Northern Command and North America Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, and General Laura Richardson, Commander of the United States Southern Command. Uh, General Richardson, I would uh, like to welcome you to your first posture hearing in your current command, and I want to thank both of you for your decades of service to our nation. On behalf of the committee, I also want to thank the women and men serving under your commands for their selfless dedication and service. Thank you very much. The United States is faced with a wide range of security threats around the globe, but we are increasingly finding these threats edging closer and closer to home. Our strategic competitors, China and Russia, are seeking ways to expand their power regionally in South America and the Arctic, as well as through advancements in long-range missile capabilities and offensive cyber tools. At the same time, this competition is unfolding amidst a global pandemic, environmental degradation from climate change, and the emergence of highly disruptive technologies. The interconnected nature of these threats compounds the challenges that NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM have been tackling for decades, and we must calibrate our approach to these regions carefully. I expect today's hearing to help inform that approach. General Van Herc, your command is responsible for protecting the homeland. Importantly, NORTHCOM is tasked with operating our homeland ballistic missile defense, the ground-based mid-course defense system, to defend the United States against intercontinental ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles. The rapid advancements we have seen on this front from states like China, Russia, and North Korea are concerning as the nature of hypersonics is difficult to defeat with the technology we currently use. General Van Herc, I would like to know your assessment of the next generation interceptor program's current schedule for deployment, and in light of recent, very recent North Korean missile tests, your confidence in the capability of our current ground-based interceptors to meet these threats. NORTHCOM also can use to play a vital role through its defense support to civil authority mission by which the U.S. military responds to requests from civil agencies for domestic assistance. This mission was highlighted recently by NORTHCOM's leadership of Operation Allies Welcome, which housed and cared for more than 84,000 evacuees from Afghanistan on military bases across the country. Further, NORTHCOM was integral to our nation's response to the COVID-19 pandemic when personnel from NORTHCOM and the National Guard distributed vaccines, ran testing centers and food banks, and supported federal health efforts. General Van Herc, I would like to know whether your command and other federal agencies have the preparations in place to manage the next pandemic outbreak or humanitarian crisis uh, should they arise. Turning to Southern Command, Southcom has traditionally focused on counter narcotics and counter tra transnational criminal organization missions. Even with limited resources, including minimal intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms, SOUTHCOM has sought to leverage non-traditional approaches, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, to serve as a testbed for new tactics and operational concepts. The SOUTHCOM region also continues to experience a rise in political instability, including violence in Haiti, Cuba, and Venezuela, and security deterioration in the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. The political and economic instability in these SOUTHCOM nations presents a situation that China, Russia, and other state actors are now seeking to exploit to increase their own influence. Short of armed conflict, a critical task to SOUTHCOM is to find ways to counter our competitors' malign activities that are coercing our partners. This includes identifying and addressing sources of insecurity and vulnerabilities among our partners that our adversaries seek to exploit to gain leverage or sow division. It is also important to strengthen the resilience of U.S. partners' security forces, including by bu building defense institutional capabilities that adhere to the rule of law and respect human rights. General Richardson, I'm interested in your assessment of the threat from near-peer competitors in the SOUTHCOM area and how we might work strategically with partners in our neighborhood, such as Mexico and Colombia, to build resilience to China and Russia's malign activities. 
I want to thank again our witnesses. I look forward to your testimony. As a reminder for my colleagues, there will be a closed section immediately following this hearing in room SBC 217. Uh, let me now turn to the ranking member, Senator Inhofe. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and welcome to our, our uh, witnesses who we've known very well for a long period of time. Our attention is rightly focused on Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and the Chinese Communist Party's constant moot march toward uh, dominance uh, in the Pacific. Uh, General Van Herc, you are responsible for the defense of the homeland. That, that's the big deal, as, uh, as we've discussed. Uh, given Putin's threats against our homeland during the uh, Ukraine war and China's threats of a military conflict with the United States over Taiwan, I hope you'll candidly speak about your requirements. Uh, do you have the resources that you need and, and uh, get in as much detail as, as you? This is the, the place to do it. I'm also concerned about the situation on the southwest uh, border. It, it's a situation that people have quit. Uh, somehow that moved off the front page and people are not as concerned about that as they as you would think they, they should be right now. We've had 12 straight months of 150,000 plus illegal immigrants being stopped at the border. Nothing like that's ever happened before. Last month, the CBP encountered nearly 165,000 illegal immigrants at the border, which is the highest total for February in the Department of Homeland Security's history. Many of my good friends on the other side of the aisle strongly opposed to President Trump when he deployed troops to assist the CBC. CBP at the border in uh, 2018, but given the scale of the current crisis, General Van Herc, I wonder uh, whether more border support uh, might be necessary uh, in, the, in the near future or currently. General Richardson, as we discussed in my office, I'm concerned about the growing Chinese threat in your area of responsibility and its national security implications. What China is doing in, uh, in Southcom reminds me of what they were doing in Africa 15 years ago. They're using predatory economic and diplomatic practices to bribe and bully countries while they set conditions to build up their military presence and limit United States access and influence. So I hope you'll explain your strategy for this very uh, daunting uh, task. And uh, I thank you very much for, for the being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Uh, let me recognize General Van Herc for his testimony. General, please, sir. Chairman Reed, Ranking uh, Member Inhofe, and distinguished me members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today alongside General Richardson. It's my honor to represent the men and women of United States Northern Command and North American Aerospace Defense Command as we defend the Uni United States and Canada. United States Northern Command and NORAD face the most dynamic and strategically complex environment in their respective histories. The commands face multiple simultaneous challenges from strategic competitors who have openly declared their intent to hold our homelands at risk in an effort to advance their own interests. Today, strategic competitors, rogue nations, non-state actors possess the capability to strike institutions and critical infrastructure in the United States and Canada. Our country is already under attack every day in the information space and the cyber domain. Our competitors, especially Russia and China, are spreading disinformation, actively sowing division and internal discord with the intent to undermine the foundation of our nation, our democracy, and democracies around the world. We're seeing this play out with Russia's invasion in, of Ukraine. Those same competitors have invested heavily in conventional precision strike capabilities and advanced delivery platforms, which Russia is currently displaying to the world. Their intent is to hold critical infrastructure in the homeland at risk below the nuclear threshold in order to disrupt and delay our ability to project power globally while attempting to undermine our will to intervene in a regional overseas crisis. I believe the strategic deterrent is the foundation of homeland defense and that it is necessary for the United States to maintain a reliable and effective nuclear triad. At the same time, I am concerned that deterrence by cost imposition 
is currently overweighted and does not adequately account for the conventional capabilities our competitors have already fielded. This over-reliance increases the risk of miscalculation and escalation because it limits our national leaders' to options in crisis and in conflict. Our competitors' advanced conventional capabilities make it necessary to balance deterrence by cost imposition with a model of deterrence by denial, an integrated deterrence that employs all elements of national influence, leverages our asymmetric advantage of our alliances and our partnerships, and provides leaders with a wide range of timely deterrence options. We must continually de demonstrate to, to potential aggressors that an attack on our homeland will result in failure. We do that by demonstrating homeland readiness, responsiveness, and resiliency, and by displaying a range of kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities to defend the homeland. NORTHCOM's support of civil authorities, our security cooperation relationships with allies and partners are critical to integrated deterrence, as is NORAD's mission to provide warning and defend the approaches to North America. This strategic environment is the new normal. This operating model that we assumed we could project power globally from a safe and secure homeland has been eroding over the last decade. To provide national leaders with timely and informed options that they need to achieve favorable outcomes, NORTHCOM and NORAD in our homeland defense design are focused on four key principles. That starts with all domain awareness. From undersea to on orbit, and everywhere in, betwe in between to include cyber domain. All domain awareness is required to achieve information dominance, which is the use of advanced capabilities like machine learning and artificial intelligence to quickly analyze, process, and deliver data to decision makers at the speed of relevance. By doing so, we will increase senior leader decision space and enable decision superiority over our competitors. Finally, today's Global, our problems are our global in all domain, and they demand globally integrated strategies, plans, and actions. These principles are vital elements of our ability to execute a layered defense and integrated deterrence, and they are critical to our nation's ability to deter in competition, de-escalate in crisis, and if necessary, defeat in conflict. I'll end by thanking the committee for all you've done to support our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, guardians, the FY22 NDAA and the recent passage of the FY22 Appropriations Omnibus continue to advance our national defense priorities and the missions of U.S. Northern Command and NORAD. Today's strategic environment calls for sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding in order to prevail. Persistently operating under continuing resolutions over the last decade has contributed to the erosion of our nation's competitive advantage. I join my fellow commanders, the service chiefs, and the Secretary in expressing my appreciation for the resources provided in the FY22 Omnibus and in urging the on-time passage of both the NDAA and a full-year appropriations bill for FY22, or 23, excuse me. Again, thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, General uh, Richardson, please, your testimony. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Alongside Gerald Van Herc, my most important teammate in keeping the Western Hemisphere safe. I'm honored to be here with you representing the men and women of U.S. Southern Command to discuss the challenges we share with our neighbors in this hemisphere and the opportunities that we can unlock together. Today, more than ever, America's fate is inextricably linked to events beyond our shores. This region, our shared neighborhood, is under assault from a host of transboundary challenges that directly threaten our own homeland. I've been in command almost five months now, and the biggest eye-opener for me has been the extent to which China and Russia are aggressively expanding their influence in our neighborhood. Latin America and the Caribbean are experiencing insecurity and instability that has been greatly exacerbated by COVID-19. The People's Republic of China, our long-term strategic competitor, continues its relentless march to expand economic, diplomatic, technological, informational, and military influence in Latin America and the Caribbean, and challenges U.S. influence in all these domains. 
Without U.S. leadership and modest investment, negative PRC influence in this region could soon resemble the self-serving predatory influence it now holds in Africa. Let's be clear, the PRC doesn't invest, they extract. Meanwhile, Russia, a more immediate threat, is increasing its engagements in the hemisphere as Putin looks to keep his options open and maintain relationships in our near abroad. In January, the Russian deputy foreign minister said he could neither affirm or exclude that Russia would send military assets to Cuba and Venezuela. Just days before the Russian unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, the Russian deputy prime minister visited Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, countries that maintain close ties with Russia and offer Putin a foothold in our hemisphere. Finally, recent visits between the presidents of Brazil and Argentina with Putin in Russia demonstrate a concerning potentially broadening of Russia ties in the region. In this hemisphere, transnational criminal organizations operate nearly uncontested and blaze a trail of corruption and violence that creates a wedge and allows the PRC and Russia to exploit these countries. They threaten citizen security, undermine public confidence in government institutions, and drive irregular migration to our homeland. These TCOs traffic opioids, cocaine, and other deadly drugs into the U.S., fueling both drug overdoses and drug-related violence. In my initial travels to Latin America and the Caribbean, it's become obvious to me that our partners are our best defense as we work together to counter our shared threats. We must use all available levers to strengthen our partnerships with the 28 like-minded democracies in this hemisphere. We must maximize important tools like security cooperation programs to train and equip our partner militaries, multilateral exercises to build interoperability, and the State Department's IMET, FMF, and FMS programs to educate, train, and build capacity that our partners use to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. Colombia, for example, our strongest partner in the region, exports security by training other Latin American militaries to counter transnational threats. U.S. Southcom is putting integrated deterrence into action every day using innovative methods to work seamlessly in all domains with the other combatant commands, the Joint Force, allies and partner nations, Congress, the U.S. interagency, NGOs, and the private sector. Now more than ever, the U.S. must lead in this hemisphere, and that requires consistent focus and a sustained investment to help build a shared neighborhood that is free, secure, and prosperous for our generation and generations to come. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, General Richardson, and uh, thank you also, General Van Herc. Uh, General Van Herc, uh, the North Korean uh, missile activity is quite disturbing. Indeed, hours ago, they launched a uh, missile which, from analysis of flight paths, suggests could hit the United States. Uh, given uh, this behavior, uh, what are your thoughts about the current 44 ground-based interceptors and their current capability? Mr. Chairman, I'm comfortable with where we are today based on the intelligence I have with the current capabilities and capacity of North Korea. Uh, going forward, I do believe that they could exceed my capacity and capabilities. That's why it's crucial to keep next generation interceptor on time or early. In my discussions with Admiral Hill, uh, he's, he's con uh, confident right now that they're on that path. As far as the total number of 44 interceptors, that's a policy decision. I look forward to seeing the missile defense review and the policy that it provides and guidance to me uh, to get after the capacity and, uh, and uh, challenges that you allude to, sir. Uh, so uh, you are at this point confident that the uh, next generation interceptor is on track for deployment. I think the plan is uh, 20 interceptors at Fort Greeley by uh, FY 2028. Is that still Chairman, holding? That is correct, and I'm confident that it, it is on track for that now or slightly early, based on what I've seen. Very good. Uh, you have uh, made your uh, input into the national defense strategy, which is yet to be announced. Uh, do you, are you confident that your uh, sort of contribution will be uh, forwarded to us? 
I am confident that my input uh, will be included. They've been very transparent in the department as they've worked this. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, General Richardson, uh, Southcom, uh, because of a lack of resources, which as a veteran of USARSO, I can tell you has been the case for many, many decades, uh, is now relying upon artificial intelligence uh, and other uh, new technologies to compensate. Could you comment upon it, uh, what you're doing and how successful you are? Absolutely, Chairman. So uh, the advanced ISR or non-traditional ISR that we utilize, since we're not given a lot of resources, we, we look for other ways of being innovative uh, and using other capabilities that uh, either the Department of Defense has or the other services are trying to use. And so we'll use that, uh, 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 all different kinds of capabilities that use the AI and ML, uh, a lot with unclassified data that can rapidly sort through that data. And then we use it to tip and queue what limited assets, the higher end assets that, uh, that we do have to help out uh, with our challenges in the AOR. Uh, you're working closely with the Department of Defense to essentially test some new innovative prototypes in a whole range of uh, both air, land, and sea? Absolutely. And uh, we have f five joint capability technology demos uh, that we have in the AOR. And I'd like to highlight in a permissive environment, uh, uh, I, I offer that because um, where our adversaries maybe aren't paying as much uh, close attention to us, we can put that to real world use uh, in our area of operations. Uh, and then it helps me with domain awareness to find our threats, see what our threats are doing, uh, because the area of war is so big. Well, I want to uh, thank you because I, I know you've been in contact with civil society groups, particularly the Sisters of Mercy. and. Uh, this whole of government and beyond approach is necessary everywhere, but particularly in Southcom. And in, in the Northern Triangle, particularly Honduras, there is a, a need to support the recently elected government and to begin seriously uh, isolating um, individuals who are either involved with criminal activities or uh, other uh, inappropriate activities and support uh, a more uh, vibrant constitutional order, and I thank you for that. Any comments about the situation in the Northern Triangle? Well, uh, uh, first, Chairman, uh, I've had uh, uh, two meetings uh, so far with the human rights uh, leaders, and Sisters of Mercy being one of them, Human Rights Watch, uh, and a couple of others, and they have such a, an important perspective. Uh, of the region. They've been traveling there for decades. They've been working in those countries for decades and certainly uh, taking their perspective and their insight of what they've seen over that period of time is, uh, is truly valuable. And we bake human rights into everything that we do in U.S. Southcom. I have a uh, human rights office in Southcom. We have had that for 25 years, but it's not about having an office. It's actually what you do with that capability and how we make that a priority in everything that we do in the AOR. Thank you very much, uh, General Van Herrick and General Richardson. Let me recognize Senator Inhofe, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said in my opening uh, statement, the crisis on the border has worsened considerably under the current administration. We've had 12 straight months of over 150,000 uh, illegal migrants, which is was a 63% increase from February 2021 and a DHS record for the month of February. Uh, and according to the internal uh, C, uh, uh, Border Patrol estimates from January through August of 21, over 273,000 migrants avoided apprehension and entered our country illegally. These are new records. This has not happened before. I'm deeply concerned that the crisis will soon get even worse. As we discussed in uh, our, my office, if the Biden administration ends the Title 42 border policy in April, illegal immigration will surge even beyond the current record-setting levels. So General Van Hurt, given the worsening conditions uh, in, in the crisis, at the southwest border, 
Are you aware of any discussion within the administration or DHS that could result in any requests for additional troops uh, at that border? Senator Inhofe, there, there is a request from the Department of Homeland Security. It's in the planning stages right now of the department to provide additional capability or capacity based on uh, the potential for uh, additional uh, immigration or uh, folks coming to the southwest border. I don't have the details of that right now, and I haven't been tasked uh, to provide any additional support to the Department of Homeland Security at yeah, this time. And I understand that, but it is a reality that's, uh, that's in, in discussion. Uh, General Richardson, it's clear that Southcom continues to be under-resourced uh, despite all of the threats in your AOR, and that's something that we need to take a closer look at as we develop our, our um, NDAA, and we'll have to do that. Now, in China, as we discussed in my office this week, I'm concerned about their growing presence in Southcom and the uh, consequences of, uh, for our military. So, General Richardson, what do you find most concerning about China's growing presence in your AOR and how, how could it be, um, uh, could it undermine DOD's ability to operate in this year's to come? <clears throat> so, uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, uh, my concern regarding Ch China in the region is just the, uh, the presence and the access and presence that they have and they've been able to create, um, partly due to the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, and the economic rollbacks that this has had in the region. So 8% of the world's population is in Southcom AOR. 33% of the world's COVID deaths were suffered. So they've had, a, uh, they've had a hard time with that. Economy has contracted 8%, plunging 22% of the population into poverty. And so when, uh, when these uh, 28 like-minded uh, democracies in this region, out of 31, uh, are trying to deliver for their people, it's hard. And when uh, China has the Belt and Road Initiative, 21 of the 31 countries in this region have signed up and are signatories to that BRI. They need to show that they're delivering for their populations in infrastructure projects is probably the best way that, uh, you know, with the BRI that, uh, that shows progress. But as we know, the work is not uh, done to standard. A lot of times it leaves these countries with even more debt than when they started. Uh, a highway in Jamaica. Jamaica now has six loans as a result of this. They lost 1,200 acres of land. And, oh, by the way, the highway uh, has a toll on it that most Jamaicans can't even, uh, can't even drive on. Uh, the Chinese uh, don't bring in and don't hire host nation workers. They bring in Chinese laborers. So they don't invest. Uh, it looks like they're investing. All they do is they take, they extract, and they have strings tied to, to uh, what they offer. Yeah, you know, we, you and I talked about this in the office. The, uh, it's so similar to what uh, the Chinese have been doing now for uh, about 15 years in, in Africa. It's uh, no surprises here, but uh, I think it's important we get into the record what is happening now because it's happening in your AOR something that you didn't anticipate, I didn't, none of us anticipated the gravity of that situation. I'm, I'm glad you're there at the helm. Thank you. Senator, what, um, what I would like to mention uh, are my two greatest concerns strategically, and that's with the Panama Canal, the projects that the Chinese have around the Panama Canal, which is uh, a strategic line of communication that we want to keep free and open for the global economy, but also for our global uh, war plans. Also, the Straits of Magellan, down around the tip of the southern cone from Argentina, uh, and the uh, presence of China and projects and things like that. And uh, so that's what uh, bothers me most, are those two strategic global lines of communication areas that uh, the Chinese have projects in and around those areas. Yeah, with everything that's going on now, it's, it's, I think it's important that we, and, and you particularly, need to keep reminding us of that, because that's something that people are just not, not aware of. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Inhofe. Let me recognize Senator Gillibrand, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Richardson, just to continue the line of questioning that Senator Inhofe started, um, given the investments that China's making, uh, regardless of how extractive they are, 
what do you think our best response is? And in particular, can you talk a little bit about how we're engaging with elected governments in the region to counter authoritarian actors? Um, are we collaborating with agencies and other institutions, with partner countries like judiciaries, legislatures, NGOs to support human rights and democracy? And further, um, I do want to get a sense of China's also adopted a partner force training model that uh, is of some concern to me, and I'd like you to assess how effective is China's partner force training in those countries that participate, and how do we ensure these re relationships are not enduring? So uh, the way I look at it, Senator, is uh, in terms of our partnerships. Um, the U.S. has partners. Uh, China has clients. Uh, they don't have the partners. And, uh, and our partner nations in the Southcom AOR want to partner with us. I go to these countries. I have visited Colombia, Brazil, Jamaica, Belize, where I uh, got to visit with leaders from seven Central American countries. Uh, Honduras, and you look in their eyes and they want to partner with us and they're having a hard time delivering for their population. I will tell you though that uh, the PRC is using our playbook in terms of how I do security cooperation and the other combatant commands, uh, the train and equip, the partnering, the exercises. Uh, the Chinese don't have exercises like we do. When we have exercises, the US, I'll bring uh, 19, 21, 29 different countries together as I said, they want to partner with us, and we have partners. Um, a great uh, relationship with the interagency and Department of State uh, in the AOR I'd like to highlight. I have my deputy, uh, who is a amb former ambassador for El Salvador, sitting behind me, Jean Maines. And I'll tell you, we're so lucky to have an ambassador from the Department of State who can help bridge and communicate and help us work more collaboratively uh, with our chiefs of mission in the AOR. We have 12 more to go for ambassadors to fill those very important seats, and eight have been nominated. So thank you for your support in getting those ambassadors in there as quickly as possible. And then just one final question before I move on uh, to General Van Herc. Um, Southcom has played an important role in humanitarian operations, especially in nations like Haiti, where U.S. support was needed not only after the natural dis disaster, but at, after the political crisis. Can you explain how you foresee any changes to Southcom's posture to continue providing humanitarian assistance, especially as climate and other issues continue to increase uh, migration? We'll continue to watch this AOR, Haiti, um, all, of the, all of the challenges that we have in this AOR that are ongoing and work very closely with, uh, uh, for a, a whole of government, a democratic solution and uh, to instability and insecurity in the region. We take that very seriously. We bake in, as I said before, human rights, the rule of law, everything that we do in our security cooperation programs. Everything that I do, my main lever, because I don't get assigned forces in Southcom, I get very limited uh, uh, gift map resources that are assigned to me as well. So I really rely on that triple three security and cooperation funding uh, to work with these partner nations uh, to help them increase the capacity and capability of their uh, militaries or their defense forces. That's helpful, General. Thank you. General Van Herc, uh, China has attempted to establish a foothold in the Arctic through economic relationships with smaller Arctic states like Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland uh, that grant China, China access to their vital natural resources. This strategy is coupled with an increase in China's Arctic capabilities to create something like a polar Silk Road. Do you see these relationships as leading to an eventual movement of Chinese military assets into the region? And then uh, further, uh, New York Air National Guard conducts several unique missions in support of our scientific missions with the National Scientific Foundation in the Arctic. Can you speak to the importance of our scientific missions in the Arctic and how it supports our overall strategic goals when it comes to that region? Thanks. First, uh, Senator, absolutely the Chinese are uh, active. Uh, in the Arctic, each of the last five years, they've sent a vessel under the guise of a resource vessel into the Arctic for military purposes, uh, we, we assess as well. And so they're there. They're influencing nations. They want to change and influence international norms and behavior as well. I would also point out, Senator, that the, the Arctic is a strategic location, and being able to operate persistently in the Arctic is something that we need to do. So the research that you're talking about is crucial in the investments. 
Finally, I understand my time's up, but they're not only active in the Arctic, they're active in the Bahamas, they're active in Mexico as well, and I would point that out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Gilmer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wicker, please. General Van Herk, let's keep talking about the Arctic then. Um, during your posture hearing last year, I asked you about the Coast Guard's authorization to build six new icebreakers, and uh, I appreciated your response in support of these ships. But as we all know, they cannot operate in the high north without fuel and, and supplies. Currently, the farthest north deep water port we have is Dutch Harbor. Um, on the other hand, Nome, Alaska, nearly 800 miles north of Dutch Harbor, has been granted money to dredge and develop a port in order to provide services to deep draft ships. How would additional icebreakers and the development of the port in Nome enable NORTHCOM to accomplish your mission in the Arctic. Thanks, Senator. First, the, the six icebreakers that are on uh, plan for the Coast Guard are crucial to enabling persistence to operate within the Arctic. Persistence is also enabled by having a fuel capability further north than currently in Dutch Harbor, in Nome, as you alluded to. That allows either the Coast Guard through their cutters or their icebreakers or Navy vessels to remain more persistent. That's strategically important to that location. I, I would like to clarify one thing. The Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was just passed provided about $250 million for the Port of Nome. Uh, the dredging portion of that is not currently funded, and it would work, require that dredging from a 30-foot depth to 40-foot for these vessels that we're talking about to get in there. We're going to work closely to make sure we can get that additional funding for that persistence I need. So the additional funding is, is not uh, adequate unless we get the dredging done? It is certainly adequate for uh, commercial operations, benefit from the local communities, indigenous people in Alaska, absolutely. For military use, we have to get the additional dredging. That's correct. Okay. Let, uh, let me switch to General Richardson. Um, the Navy Small Craft Instruction and Technical Training School, NAVSKIOTS, provides training to partner nations from every combatant command. To date, the school has trained over 13,000 students from more than 120 partner nations. What's the importance of keeping NAVSKIOTS? What are the potential risks in terms of international support and partnerships should its capacity be reduced? Well, thank you for the question, Senator, because NAVSKIOTS is uh, a force multiplier. And, uh, and it's for all of our nations. As you said, 123 partner nations utilize this school, over 13,000 trained. Uh, this school has been open for 52 years. And quite honestly, what it does, low level, it's pennies to operate. You talk about a low cost, re high return on investment, this is it. And, uh, and quite honestly, if you think about it, the U.S. Navy has big ships. Other nations, there are very few other nations that have really big vessels. Um, and most of the other uh, navies and coast guards from the other partner nation militaries as well as the coast guards uh, have smaller vessels. You talk about the Amazon. Uh, they don't have highways. They have rivers. And uh, they need the training. They need uh, uh, their smaller vessels to get this training. And it's absolutely critical uh, to our security cooperation and helping build our um, defense forces and our militaries and naval Good. Uh, maritime operations. I, I do appreciate that. L let me follow up on, on an engagement that, that Senator Inhofe and Senator Gillibrand had with you. Uh, I think the discussion with, with uh, Senator Inhofe was um, like-minded democracies in, in uh, Southcom working with us Senator Gillibrand asked about engaging with elected governments. Um, let me just mention that the Organization of American States is based here in Washington, D.C., is the only multilateral organization that includes every country in the Western Hemisphere except for, uh, for Cuba. And, um, and, I, and I would point out to my colleagues that in 2020, President Trump signed into law the Organization of American States Legislative Engagement Act. Senator Cardin and I were leaders in this effort, um, just as we have uh, tried to enhance our participation with European parliamentarians, both in and out of majorities in government in Europe through the OSCE. Um, do you agree um, that uh, moving to a parliament 
parliamentary assembly as the um, Trump uh, law um, anticipates would be um, uh, would be a positive and could promote cooperation in a variety of government and security issues. Senator, I think that increased engagement in this AOR can be nothing but good. Uh, I, can't, I can only cover so much. Our Department of State can over, only cover so much. And with the uh, a program, a strategy, a focus on this area, as I said in my opening statement, uh, can only be more goodness. Because uh, out of 31 countries and uh, 16 dependencies in the Caribbean, it's a lot of ground to cover. And I would certain, certainly welcome uh, the focus and the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Wicker. And now... Uh, since a quorum is present, I ask the committee to consider a list of 2,766 pending military nominations. All of these nominations have been before the committee their quiet length of time. Is there a motion to favor to report this list of 2,766 pending military nominations to the Senate? Uh, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you very much. The motion carries, and let me recognize Senator Kane and thank Senator Tillis for staying with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witnesses for your service. General Richardson, I want to uh, echo a point that uh, Senator Inhofe made. I, I continue to believe that Southcom is really under-resourced. Uh, you've talked about the value of the security cooperation program. Describe the kinds of activities that that you engage with our uh, regional partners and through the security cooperation program. So we have a, a myriad of uh, things that we do in terms of the training and the equipping. We do things from small teams, uh, uh, eight to 13 man teams. We do it in all the domains, special ops included, cyber, information ops. Uh, we do big exercises, as I mentioned before, Panamex. Uh, which is really a defense of the Panama Canal exercise. 29 countries from this AOR participate in that with us. Uh, we have trade wins. That's been a name that's been around for decades, and that's a security operation uh, in a contested environment that we, talk, that we train to. Uh, that will bring 21 countries together. Uh, my components, my Navy component, will do UNITAS this year. Brazil will host that. Uh, that will bring 19 countries together. And when you see the picture of UNITAS, uh, of all the different vessels, the ships the, um, and vessels that, from the other countries and the navies and the coast guards, it, it's just really impressive. And, and, Gen and General Richardson, just to give the committee kind of a magnitude, you, you have you know, nearly 30 countries in your AOR. I believe General uh, Admiral Fowler last year testified that the total security cooperation budget for Southcom to do the activities you describe with that many nations is $120 million. Um, so that's the that's sort of what we're talking about, right? That's correct, Senator. And uh, it's a it's I know that seems like a lot of money, but when I don't have assigned forces and gift map capabilities, and that's my main lever for engaging with the partner nations. Uh, that's really a low-cost, uh, high return on investment. Let me ask about another program, the IMET program, International Military Education Training Program. That's another uh, – security cooperation tends to be in the AOR, but IMET, we bring um, leaders from Southcom militaries, uh, nations to the United States for training. That is also very small budget, but describe to the committee – the value of the IMET program in Southcom. That's huge. That's the professional military education. That's where they get to come, for example, to our war college, uh, which is at the lieutenant colonel level. Right now, I have 17 chiefs of defense and six ministers of defense that have been to school in the United States. They know that they, uh, they get the best education and training when they come here. They want to come here. And what we try to work with at $13 million annually is to uh, have sustained uh, sustain consistent um, personnel from their militaries attending our professional military education. Well, th these are both relatively small investments um, in Southcom, uh, a region without assigned forces, as General Richardson says. And I'm just going to suggest to my committee colleagues, watch this space. I think there's going to be a budget submitted to us very soon. And look at the dollars in these two accounts to Southcom. I, I have a grave concern that challenges elsewhere in the world are going to take these 
de minimis investments and shrink them even more. Uh, and if that's the case, I'm going to be advocating strongly that we don't do less, but we do more in the region. My understanding, General Richardson, is also with respect to cyber assets. I know nations like Colombia are dealing with a lot of cyber attacks and misinformation from actors in Venezuela and elsewhere. They get particularly active around elections. There's many elections that are happening in the region this year. Um, U.S. Cyber Command has so much on them. I understand in Southcom, your cyber assets are, are, are pretty limited. You're making good use of a state partnership program with the South Carolina Guard. Good on them and good on you for using them in an effective way, but I understand that Cyber Command does not have many assets that it can currently allow to be used in Southcom. Am I right about that? That's correct, Senator. Um, they, they have more higher priorities uh, looking towards uh, Europe and then also in the Indo-PACOM region. Uh, and so it, uh, and I'd just like to highlight and thank all the senators for the support of this uh, National Guard State Partnership Program, which is a huge force multiplier for Southcom. We, we are not paying attention to this region. Um, you know, we're not paying attention to them on, on diplomatic circles. We're not, we're not paying sufficient attention to them in terms of vaccine distribution, and we're not paying attention to them in the military area. But other nations, especially China, are paying a lot of attention and I think we should do better. I want to thank you for your testimony. Well, thank you, Senator Kane. And let me now recognize Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Richardson, General Van Herk, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, General Van Herk, in your prepared testimonies discussion of hypersonic threats, you state, quote, the impact is the loss of critical decision space for national level decision makers regarding continuity of government and the preservation of retaliatory capabilities, resulting in an increase in the potential for strategic deterrence failure, end quote. You make a similar assessment of cruise missile threats, saying, quote, additionally, these advanced cruise missiles and their supporting platforms will limit national leadership de decision space and my ability to provide threat warning and attack assessment, which directly influences my ability to support continuity of government operations and provide support to STRATCOM missions. Again, the potential consequence is an increased risk of strategic deterrence failure. Can you elaborate, please, on what you mean about the threat to continuity of government and the risk of deterrence failure? Senator, sure. So uh, one of my biggest challenges is domain awareness. And hypersonics and cruise missiles significantly challenge my ability to conduct my NORAD mission of providing threat warning and attack assessment. What you can't see and what you, uh, uh, you can't deter and you can't defend from, and they will significantly challenge me. Why I primarily do that is exactly for, to support continuity of government and the su su uh, survivable uh, of our nuclear posture, our nuclear forces as well. And when you can't do that, then you have to make some assumptions that those threats might be nuclear threats that, that will be inbound, and that increases the risk of miscalculation and also the risk of strategic deterrence failure. So that's my number one priority, is to gain that domain awareness so I can provide that threat warning and attack assessment. I'm currently not tasked to defend against hypersonics. I look forward to seeing the missile defense review. I am tasked to defend against cruise missiles, and that's a very tough mission for me right now without domain awareness. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, NORAD. Could you um, update us on our partnership with the Canadians there, please? The Canadians are an outstanding ally. Uh, Militarily, uh, I have uh, hundreds of them working for us at the headquarters at uh, NORAD, uh, my combined headquarters. Uh, I've met uh, multiple times the chief of the defense staff, my boss on the NORAD side, is coming to visit me next week as well. Uh, Minister Anand, uh, I've met with her in person as well in Canada. Great, uh, great allies. Uh, Canada uh, is in the decision-making process to support NORAD modernization. I look forward to seeing where they go with NORAD modernization. I think the world uh, requires us to think hard about modernizing the forces to operate across the entire AOR for NORAD, which includes the Arctic and the infrastructure and the communication capabilities as well. And so I look forward to seeing what they come up with. Thank you. Um, we, we saw this morning that North Korea uh, did another long-range missile test. 
to demonstrate that their ballistic missile capabilities continue to grow and that the threat to the homeland, I believe, is continuing to increase. With this in mind, is it your view that next generation interceptor, the NGI, needs to be fielded as soon as possible? Absolutely, Senator. Uh, as soon as we can get that here, I'm, I'm confident the contract mechanism rewards fielding it faster, and I'm glad it's on track right now. To be clear on this, when you say it's on track right now, so to be clear on this, do you think delaying the schedule or changing the requirements would put us at a serious risk of being unable to pace ballistic missile threats to our homeland? Senator, I'm very concerned about my ability to pace the capacity of production that we uh, assess and the capability that we assess the North Koreans uh, continue to adapt to. That's why the funding for the Service Life Extension Program for the current ballistic missile defense capability is so crucial. Thank you for that funding. And that's why Next Generation Interceptor is crucial as well, because it will help both get after the additional capacity problems and the capability problems. Thank you. Uh, General Richardson, in the time we have remaining, uh, can you talk about the role that you see that China and Russia are playing in your AOR? And specifically, how do we improve um, the relations we have, the quality of our engage engagements to better compete? I know, I know um, we're friends and they're, they're clients, viewed as clients, um, but can you be more specific on what needs to be done? The way I'm on the field, I don't need to out, uh, outspend China to outcompete them, but I do need my security cooperation funding, that triple three funding to do uh, security cooperation to help build uh, the capacity and capability within those militaries and defense forces, which helps them secure their borders, which helps them with uh, internal security in their country, and then also be exporters of training uh, to other Latin American countries, and then in peacekeeping operations around the world, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to NORTHCOM, UCOM, and PACOM, my concern is that in a moment of crisis is a question of who's in charge. Uh, are you satisfied with the coordination level uh, between the three combatant commands and the Canadians uh, in case of, a, of a, some kind of uh, a crisis in the in the Arctic, Senator. I'm comfortable with the way the uh, unified campaign plan is currently uh, laid out. We have uh, outstanding relationships with Canada, outstanding relationships with uh, UCOM and Indo-PACOM. I do think we need to look at, based on threat changes, um, how we would command and control those capabilities. So, for example, uh, the the threats to the homeland today do not reside in my area of responsibility. They are actually existing in other areas of responsibility, such as the Indo-PACOM area of responsibility and the UCOM area of responsibility. So I do think there's potential gaps and seams that we need to uh, make sure that we close those in a time of crisis and conflict to ensure we don't have uh, challenges that were unaccounted for. That's, that's exactly my question, and I hope that there will be work actively done to close those gaps and seams uh, because we don't want to be working on that in the middle of a crisis. We want the, the structure to be on the shelf ready to, ready to operationalize. Uh, can the current missile defense system that we have uh, defend us against uh, hypersonics? Uh, Senator, I'm not tasked to defend against them, but uh, no, uh, it, it can't because we don't have the domain awareness at this time. We don't have the domain awareness. We also don't have the technology uh, to deal. So I, I think that's important to understand that we do have missile defense. It's important for ballistic missiles, but it, it will not uh, suffice when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to hypersonics. Uh, General Richardson, could you estimate what percentage of worldwide ISR uh, resources we have to uh, utilize in the in the Southcom AOR? So, Senator, I get about 1 percent or a little bit less than 1 percent of the global ISR. I was going to, that's what I was afraid you were going to say, and I, I, I frankly am just, I, I just can't believe that, because we're talking, America is under attack. The principal attack on America right now is, is drugs, 
300 people a day, that's almost, that's, that's one 9-11 every two weeks. Two people in my state every day are dying, are dying of, of overdoses. Uh, and yet, we're treating it as if it's some kind of domestic problem or a law enforcement problem. This is an attack, and the fact that you have 1 percent of the ISR to keep track of this, uh, of this threat, to me, is, is a gross misallocation of resources. I realize it's not your responsibility, but I, I guess my next question is, why, in your opinion, are we, are we so short of ISR? If this is, if we need it in a particular area, why don't we build more global hawks? I, I, I just don't understand why this is not something that we can't budget for and deal with. So, Senator, I, I and all my uh, fellow combatant commanders will, will always say that we don't have enough uh, to see and uh, be able to see the threats in our AOR. Well, the budget ought to reflect that fact so that we can fill that gap. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward sort of mathematical question. Well, and uh, I certainly appreciate Congress uh, uh, always gives me a little extra funding for ISR, and so we have some contracted, uh, operated contractor owned um, assets and, uh, for airplanes that actually help me with ISR in the region, uh, be able to uh, look for threats and look for uh, counter narcotics, illicit trafficking. Let me, ask, let me ask you the same question that I asked General Van Herc, and that is, uh, one of my principles of management is that you always want to have one throat to choke. Who's in charge of the anti-drug activities in, in, uh, your, in Latin America? Who's in charge? So, Senator, I am in charge for detection and monitoring, and that is uh, to get actionable information about illicit drug trafficking, either by air or maritime. Who's in uh, charge of interdiction? And for interdiction, that would be DHS and our law enforcement uh, agencies. But there's no one individual who can be held responsible for the, for the overall uh, dealing with this issue. Is that correct? I would say that uh, that would be our Department of Homeland Security, Senator. Well, I think that's something we have to, we have to strengthen and clarify. Uh, I'm not going to pursue this, but uh, for the record, I would hope you would give us more detail on what you mentioned uh, to, uh, earlier about the Panama Canal and Chinese activity, I uh, understand, at either end of the Panama Canal, as well as the Straits of Magellan. I think that's a very, very serious matter and would like to have more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Cotton, please. General Richardson, I'll give you a chance to talk in a little bit more detail about the Panama Canal because I was troubled uh, by um, the, the brief comments you had to Senator Inhofe of all the things you've described that China, China is doing in your area of responsibility. I think the strategic investments that's made along the Panama Canal is most striking. Um, I know that this is primarily um, a State Department and Treasury matter, but can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on around the canal and how Southcom plays into the interagency efforts to counter the threat and what else you'd like to see from the U.S. government to do so? Um, thank you for the question, Senator. We work very closely with, uh, with Panama, um, and our Corps of Engineers uh, just uh, was able to uh, uh, negotiate a water tender contract with, um, with Panama, which I think is huge because it's been 15 years in the making. And so we have a lot of ground to make up with, uh, with Panama. But in terms of the investment, um, China and uh, the strategic investments that they make uh, you know, I, uh, just like the Panama Canal, uh, when you enter and exit and on either side, you have Chinese state-owned enterprises. And what I worry about uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, that have uh, capability and infrastructure there is that uh, they're used, they, they can be used for dual use, which means civilian but also military. And uh, quite honestly, if you just look at where the port projects are, 29 port projects in the AOR, uh, in 17 countries. I mean, these are very methodically thought out, in my opinion. And again, I worry about the access that they get in there under the guise of infrastructure and, and looking like they're helping economies when they're really not, as well as the resources that are in this AOR. It's just off the charts. I've got 60% 60, 60 of the world's lithium in the lithium triangle in, so in South America. That's in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. 
Um, you've got 31% of the world's fresh water. You have the Amazon. Uh, you have uh, the, the oil reserves in Venezuela, the light, sweet crude that was discovered off the shores of Guyana. There are a lot of resources in this region. Uh, and again, I go back to the, it's not an investment by our competitors. It's, it's there to extract in some way, shape, or form. What do you think China is up to there um, in all those investments around the canal? Um, is it more about advancing their own interests or holding at risk and threatening ours? I think it's both. Um, I mean, we depend on the canal more because of our geography than does China, right? Uh, I would say that the, I would say yes, um, but the Panama Canal as well as the Strait of Magellan, uh, in my AOR, those two very strategic global lines of communication must remain open. I agree. I mean, it, should we ever have a conflict with China, uh, the decisive effort would be somewhere in the Western Pacific. Um, not in the Caribbean Basin or the Eastern Pacific. And it's the very essence of strategy to try to force your adversary to defend what he has no choice but to defend, far removed from the theater of decision. That's one reason I'm so worried about these investments around the canal. You know, the Panama Canal Treaty was actually two treaties. One of them was the Neutrality Treaty. We retain under that Neutrality Treaty uh, the uncontested right to ensure the neutral operation of the canal, correct? That's correct, Senator. Good. Um, one other area I wanted to discuss uh, was agriculture. I know this is somewhat removed from the Department of Defense's lane, but as we heard, you have no assigned forces, and a lot of what you do is with interagency partners and looking at uh, non-military, non-traditional ways to cooperate. Um, sometimes people overlook the importance of agriculture. I don't think China overlooks it if you consider their investments in South America especially targeting crops like soybeans. Um, I think this economic investment seems to be aimed at creating alternative markets for them to buy as well as to crowd out our exports. Uh, fortunately for us, Brazil's soybean crop uh, didn't compare so well to ours, especially in Arkansas. Can you give me your thoughts on how you can work with agencies like AID and the trade representative um, to dissuade countries in your area of responsibility from continuing down the path of further economic entanglement uh, with China in the agriculture domain? So, Senator, we work uh, very closely, as I mentioned before, regarding the, uh, the folks that we have that work in the Western Hemisphere. And so we have a very close working relationship with, uh, with USAID. And uh, I've met with Director Powers previously, and then she travels the region as well. But uh, uh, none of us have the resources, and so I think that, that helps us work together more collab collaboratively across all of the interagency and work so close together to, uh, to figure out how we can invest in this region. But I'd also like to highlight that China gets 36% of its food source from, uh, from this AOR as well. Uh, and so uh, the AOR just has a, a lot of resources that are being eyed by, by our competitors. Yeah, they are. And I think this is going to be a matter of growing importance this year, given the war in Ukraine and how much uh, grain Ukraine and Russia provide to the rest of the world, as well as how many inputs they provide into fertilizer uh, or other agricultural inputs, not only in increasing prices on our grocery shelves here in America, but also um, threats to stability uh, in your region and in Africa and the Middle East in places that have pretty fragile governments and very limited food supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Blumenthal, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your service. Thanks for being here today. Uh, this morning, President Biden announced that the United States will welcome 100,000 Ukrainian refugees who are fleeing an absolutely intolerable situation in Ukraine. I recently visited the border of Ukraine and Poland with a number of colleagues, a bipartisan trip, and saw the women and children. They are almost all women and children fleeing the horror and terror that Putin has caused to their country. And they'll come here through a variety of legal pathways and likely follow the same 
general program as the Afghan refugees did. I continue to call on the administration to enable more of our at-risk Afghan allies to escape the Taliban. They have targets on their backs. They helped Americans, our troops, our diplomats, while we were there. And they are under dire threat from the Taliban. But I also applaud the President for his effort to welcome Ukrainians into the United States. And there's much more to be done. The 3.5 million refugees who have already fled Ukraine and the 10 million more internally displaced have added to an already burgeoning refugee and humanitarian crisis around the globe. Literally, last year, 26 million refugees, 26 million refugees were displaced from areas as diverse as Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Myanmar, and other countries. And these refugees represent a threat as well as an opportunity, literally an opportunity because they have a great deal of talent and skills and potential for contributing to the countries that they may be moving to, but also a threat insofar as the failure to aid them will lead to potential terrorism and other adverse activity. I've seen the tremendous support that NORTHCOM provided to Operation Allies Welcome over the last year in finding capacity on U.S. bases and efficiently housing and processing Afghan refugees fleeing the Taliban. And I hope that NORTHCOM will play a role as well in welcoming and resettling the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, General Van Herk, have you been given instructions on the role for NORTHCOM with respect to Ukrainian refugees? Senator, I'm aware of the President's announcement. I do not have any direct mission task to plan for that yet. Uh, as we did with Operation Allies Welcome, we stand ready, if directed by the Secretary of Defense, to do that. Uh, it was an honor to support nearly 74,000 Afghans as we process them through eight installations from DOD. And so, uh, once, if, if directed, we'll move out, Senator. Are there lessons that we should learn from the OAW experience with the Afghan refugees? There, there are absolutely lessons that we've incorporated uh, that, that we learned during Allies Welcome that, that I'm sure would make us better prepared if we had to stand up to do this mission again. What kinds of lessons? Uh, Interagency coordination lessons to make uh, more efficient use of data and information, the, uh, the ability to track, uh, categorize, uh, whether it be medical, whether it be security screening, all of these things were worked closely and we're in a much better place today than we were when we started last July. Well, I was uh, tremendously impressed when I visited uh, Quantico, which is only one of those eight, with the uh, enthusiasm and dedication of the Marines who were involved at Quantico in welcoming and aiding the refugees there. Many, most of them had never served in either Afghanistan or Iraq. For them, this was their deployment, so to speak, and they loved doing it. And they provided a real American welcome to these new Americans. And I think that we can all be proud of the work that was done by our military at those bases in providing that first American experience to the Afghan refugees. And I hope the same is done with respect to Ukrainian refugees. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Rounds, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by thanking both of you for your service to our country. I'd like to begin with General Van Herk. Uh, with regards to your mission and your role in keeping our country safe, could you share with us what uh, the activities at our southern border and the challenges that we face at our southern border right now 
with regard to uh, transnational uh, criminal organizations, uh, violent extremist organizations, and so forth, and the the, uh, the the porousness of that that border right now. Can you share with us what the impact is that that might have on your responsibilities and role? Senator, currently I'm in direct support of the Department of Homeland Security providing about 2,450 uh, National Guard's troops on Title X status. What, what they're doing is detection and monitoring, intel analysis, uh, and aviation support. Um, uh, we're really treating the symptoms, you know, counter-narcotics, uh, migration, human trafficking, those kinds of things are symptoms, in my mind, of a broader problem, and that's transnational criminal organizations who create an environment that's not conducive to raising a family for economic success, and we see that happening right on our border uh, in Mexico. My concern with that, Senator, is the instability it creates, the opportunity it creates for actors such as China, Russia, and others who might have nefarious activities on their mind to seek access and influence in our AOR from a national security perspective. Do you see evidence of that at this time? There are actors who are very aggressive and active all across the NORTHCOM AOR to include in the Bahamas, in Mexico, uh, China, and Russia. I, I would point out that the, the largest portion of uh, GRU members in the world uh, is in Mexico right now. Those are Russian intelligence uh, personnel, uh, and they keep an eye very closely on their opportunities to uh, have influence on U.S. Uh, opportunities and access. General Richardson, this is your AOR. Uh, would you concur uh, with the general's assessment? Yes, Senator. Does that impact your ability to do your role, or how does that impact your ability to fill out or to, to complete your assignments there? So uh, we work uh, very closely with our partner nations, and as um, and as I've said, how important the lever is for security cooperation for us to be on the field, to have our jersey on, have our number, uh, and work shoulder to shoulder with our partners. They really want to work with us. And, uh, and everything that, uh, all the levers that I have that uh, you all provide and that I get from the Department of Defense, the Department of State, um, go into action. A little goes a long way in this AOR. Uh, again, I don't need to outcompete my competitors um, but the, uh, or outspend them to outcompete them. But we do have to be present and we do have to be there with them. Today we fight war, or at least we have to be able to defend against war that comes from multiple domains, air, land, and sea, space, and cyberspace. Uh, I understand that, that right now, with regard to cyber capabilities, uh, there's a limit to the number that we have. General Richardson, can you share with us the challenges you face in terms of being able to meet your responsibilities with the limited cyber capabilities or cyber, cyber defense capabilities that we have? So the, uh, we do our best in terms of the small teams, the subject matter exchanges, subject, subject matter expert exchanges that we do with our partner nations. We'll go with like a, a cyber assessment team to help with a, a, an assessment of their network, maybe a 13-man team that works with the partner nation. Uh, we work over the shoulder. We, uh, we cannot... Uh, we can provide direction and uh, subject matter expertise, but we can't get on the keyboards with them and, and, uh, and go to work with them. Well, let me ask this in a different way. If, if uh, in order to do your mission, uh, are you able to receive the number and types of cyber mission teams that you request? Um, we're able to do that through our National Guard State Partnership Program. Cybercom does not have the, uh, the full capacity and capability to support all the combatant commands. And I'm not a priority AOR. Uh, and uh, as we see, the UCOM and Indopaycom are the, uh, right now the two priorities. And so... Demand I, exceeds supply then. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, General Van Herk, with regards to all domain awareness... Can you very briefly describe to us just how critical cyber is and the challenges that you face in getting the resources that you need? Senator, uh, cyber domain awareness is absolutely critical. The vast majority of the key critical infrastructure in the United States of America and Canada, for that matter, exists in the private sector. 
uh, today. I'm very comfortable where we are with General Nakasone and his teams on the, uh, the DODEN, uh, the Department of Defense uh, Infrastructure, uh, CISA with other federal networks, but domain awareness outside of that is relatively an unknown. You, you know, the, uh, the, the many of those uh, municipalities, uh, companies, uh, their reporting is all we get. And so they, they actually are voluntarily playing. And so in, from a domain, a domain awareness perspective, we don't know exactly what we don't know. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank both the witnesses. I think you uh, both are doing an exceptional job and an important AOR that don't always get the attention that they deserve. Uh, General Van Herk, I appreciate our meeting the other day. I want to talk a little bit uh, more and follow up on the discussion about the provision that Senator King and I um, co-sponsored in the NDAA on the Arctic Security Initiative. You're already hearing here in this hearing a uh, number of senators, bipartisan group of senators, are very focused on that. Um, as you know, it authorizes the SECDEF to establish an Arctic Security Initiative, which is modeled on the Pacific Deterrence Initiative and the European Deterrence Initiative, essentially initiatives from this committee where we have thought the Pentagon wasn't focusing enough on critical regions. And I think both of them, PDI and EDI, have been quite prophetic, saying, hey, Pentagon, focus, Europe, Asia, Taiwan, and now the Arctic. Can you please provide a status on the update regarding the assessment? Um, any conclusions you've drawn? As you know, the Arctic Security Initiative that was passed into law directs you, the NORTHCOM commander, not OSD, to complete an independent security assessment of the Arctic. Senator, we're in progress with the uh the assessment, what I commit to you is you will get an honest, candid assessment from me. I will coordinate that across the department. Uh, I expect to have my portion of it complete within the next uh, few weeks. Then the coordination will begin. The suspense is here in the very near future. I'm likely going to ask for an extension. I believe it's crucial to not do this fast, but to do it right, and I hope to have it done uh, by early summer at the latest. I would point, point out real quick, if you don't mind, that I look forward to seeing what the budget comes out with next week with regards to Arctic for inclusion into my assessment. Uh, are there any things that you can highlight already right now with this committee uh, in terms of your assessment? Uh, Senator, without seeing the 23 budget, I, I really can't give you a full assessment of, of uh, what we're going to see for infrastructure support. I, I believe we will see uh, additional domain awareness capabilities significantly funded uh, with the 23 budget, but I look forward to seeing that. Uh, I, I would assess that there may still be some work to do with regards to the strategies that each of the services have funded or are not funded but put out and the department strategy. But uh, when the budget comes out, I'll give you the final assessment. Let me ask specifically on that, when Secretary Austin was here for his confirmation hearing, I asked if he would commit to work with this committee to ensure the Arctic strategies from the different services are fully resourced. And he said, quote, you have my commitment to do that. That's what he told the committee. Do you believe funding for the Arctic Security Initiative in a similar manner that has been done for PDI and EDI is critical to our integrated deterrence efforts in the Arctic, and are, and are you seeing that funding? Now, I'm not talking about the upcoming budget. I'm talking about what you've seen in the last year. To answer the last question, uh, we have not seen uh, the funding that I would like to see with regards to the Arctic. So the strategies are coming together. I think they're all coming together well. They're serious. That's a big change from a couple years ago. But you're not seeing the funding as of yet. In the past, that's correct, Senator. I look forward to seeing the 23 budget. The Arctic is strategic in nature. We must be persistent there to compete. That's a part of the integrated deterrence that you uh, mentioned as well. So just for the Pentagon folks watching, um, it's not just forces, but as Senator Wicker talked about, it's infrastructure. 
I know that it gives some people a uh, neuralgia in the Pentagon when we talk about strategic Arctic ports, but that's what we need, isn't it, General? The capability to have presence in a strategic region where one of the most brutal dictators in the world, Vladimir Putin, has said he's going to own the Arctic, he's going to create the new Suez Canal and the northern sea route, and he's going to dominate it. Don't we need a presence ourselves to push back on this dictator in that region of the we world? Do. We do need a presence, and fuel north of Dutch Harbor would do that, as would infrastructure and communications capabilities. I look forward to working with the Canadians on their part of this. They need to be part of it as well, not only the Department of Defense, especially on the infrastructure piece. Well, just a final point, Mr. Chairman. I think this committee has been very strong on this over the last several years in a bipartisan way. And I think the Pentagon needs to wake up. They need to wake up and recognize this is a strategic interest for our nation. And um, the signal that's coming from the Congress couldn't be more clear. Just like with the European Deterrence Initiative, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, the Arctic Security Initiative falls in that line. And I look forward to working with you and this committee on your assessment and seeing it soon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, Senator Sullivan uh, on the, the strategic importance of the Arctic and investments uh, in the Arctic. And I think it is a, a consensus with members of this committee in a bipartisan way that we need to, to be focused uh, on that. Uh, I had some questions related to that. Senator Sullivan did a great job of uh, addressing uh, some of the questions that I had. But maybe just pick up one thing with you, General Herrick, is that uh, National Guard Bureau uh, to what extent are you working with them to ensure that uh, they're ready to conduct some cold weather operations um, uh, in that region? We, we work with all the services, including the National Guard Bureau, to do that. Actually, I'm highly reliant on the National Guard Bureau to execute my day-to-day -day campaign plan uh, in, a, in a voluntary status, actually, so I couldn't be more proud and, and uh, appreciate the support because I don't get access to the forces through the global force management process, and I don't have the assigned forces to do that campaign plan. Uh, I'd point out that we need ready, trained, and equipped forces to operate throughout my entire area of responsibility, and that includes the Arctic. That's part of the services strategy and something that we have to work on. I just concluded an Arctic Edge exercise, which included some of the National Guard and many of the services, a joint exercise, and some allies and partners. Uh, in a classified environment, I'll sh share some observations with you from that, but the Arctic is a challenging environment to operate in, and we have work to, that remains. Right. Appreciate that. General, uh, you, uh, General Van Herk, uh, uh, U.S. intelligence indicates that Russia may be positioning itself to use uh, chemical weapons in Ukraine under the guise of a, of a false flag. And certainly while our hearts go out to the, the brave Ukrainians who are defending their country from this uh, illegal invasion and, and fighting for freedom, I think we also must use this crisis as an opportunity to consider our, our own preparedness uh, for such an attack. So my question for you is, do you believe the United States is properly prepared to contain and respond to chemical attacks in the homeland? And are there any resource shortfalls uh, impacting uh, Seaburn response enterprise? So I believe we're prepared to execute a response to a small event such as we have planned for based on a violent extremist type organization uh, event. For a large scale event in the homeland, I think there's much work that still needs to be done that could be additional uh, resources applied to, Senator. Great, thank you. General Richardson, uh, in your reply to uh, Senator Kane. Uh, a question that Senator Kane offered. You, you described the importance of small team engagement with our allies uh, and partners. Uh, nearly every nation in uh, Southcom AOR participates in the National Guard State Partnership uh, Program, as you're well aware. My question for you is, is how do you plan to employ your National Guard State Partnership Program units to, to deepen the, the defense relationships uh, that we have in the region? So this is a huge force multiplier, Senator, uh, the state partnership program. And in some cases, uh, two, three decades of relationships uh, that have evolved. And we see the, the impact of that with Ukraine and California and that relationship that they have. And so uh, there was a creation a few years ago of the bilateral affairs officer, which is a National Guard officer that's actually embedded uh, in the embassies with the DOD team there. 
and, uh, and then helps integrate that state partnership program in my campaign plan and strategy for the region. And, uh, and as was brought out in uh, other questions, you know, I don't have all the resources I need, but that is reach back into the National Guard and the capabilities, especially with the cyber battalions, uh, to help me with, uh, with uh, operations in uh, the cyberspace domain. Yeah, an area that we need to have uh, increased focus on, uh, without, without question. Uh, another question for you, uh, General, is are you seeing the Chinese or the Russian militaries copy these types of efforts uh, in collaborating with regional militaries for training opportunities? Uh, is this something I, they're picking up as well? I do, Senator. Uh, I see them using part of our playbook uh, against us, actually. And what I, I've said before is that they don't have partners, uh, they have clients. And so when we do our big exercises and bring, you know, 20 some countries together from the region, they don't do that, but they do have a lot of, uh, of funding to bring large groups of personnel from the militaries or the defense forces to all expense paid professional military education in Beijing for either a year or two years. And if they do that, if I take the country of Guyana, for example, and they do 15 or 20 a year, they can get through their defense force in about, you know, uh, five years. And so we've got to, uh, as I've said before, I don't need to outspend uh, China, but I do to outcompete them, but I do need to be on the field and my security cooperation and IMET funding uh, a little bit goes a long way. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Scott, please. Thank you, Chairman. General Richardson, uh, can you, first off, thank both of you for being here. Thanks for the people, your, your service and the people, the men and women that work with you. General Richardson, Richardson, can you describe what you've seen from our enemies over the past six months that you've had this command, and what do you believe their primary goals are in our hemisphere? So, uh, frankly, the, uh, I'm, uh, I'm surprised at uh, how much the, uh, our competitors have been able to uh, expand within the region and how they've done that with the proximity to the homeland. Uh, and what, I've, uh, what I find myself doing is a lot of educating and informing about my AOR as I travel around and speak to different groups and, and go to different uh, places to uh, offer the message and just educate folks. Because we tend to look east and west, not necessarily south. And, uh, and I can fly to 80% of this AOR. It's huge. It looks huge and it looks really far away. I can fly to 80% of it in two to three hours from Miami. And a lot of people don't, uh, you know, we've just kind of forgotten about that. Uh, I would say with the investment of infrastructure over the last five years by uh, our long-term strategic competitor, China, from 17 to 21, an investment of over 50 billion. Uh, I have Corps of Engineers, and we average about 50 million per year. So from 17 to 21, about 250 million investment in the region. Now, that's not it. I mean, USAID is there, and there are other... Um, uh, businesses and corporations that are in the region, uh, but there's a, there's a huge investment by, by our long-term strategic competitor in the region. Some of these countries as well, as I look to levers, uh, levers that allow me to uh, out-compete my adversary, uh, foreign military sales, um, IMET, foreign military financing, security cooperation, um, being able to have responsive levers. We can't take a year to two years when our, you know, our partner nations are asking for capability. A couple helos, uh, uh, fighter jet, um, weapons, vehicles, and we take two years. Our process has got to be able to evolve with the, uh, with the times, and, uh, and we got to be faster. Do you see in, in, um, in our hemisphere that Russia and China have become clearly no question about it, their adversaries? Um, they are definitely competitors, and I do look at them as adversaries. So when you see American companies that go do business in China uh, with Chinese, the Chinese government, with the Chinese military, does that make your job harder or less hard? Uh, I look at it from a perspective of the, the dual use. You have, they come under the guise of infrastructure, doing a good thing for that particular country that, uh, that they're, they look like they're investing in. They don't do a good, a, a good job on the project in the first place. That generally becomes evident in anywhere from five to seven years after a project is done. They don't hire host nation workers. They bring in their own laborers. Um, it, it's... Uh, 
I, I would say from my perspective, it, it, uh, it's, I worry about the civilian and dual use with the military and the PRC being able to bring in and use, uh, switch something over that's a state-owned enterprise to military use. When, they, when the Chinese bring in their own labor, do they take it back when it's finished, when the project's finished, or do they leave their labor there? I think it depends. Um, I think they, uh, they actually do both. Okay. Do you see signs of our enemies actively supplying weapons uh, to any state or group, state or group in Latin America? Yes. Right. And is that increasing, decreasing? What's happening? I think over uh, recently, probably over the past couple of years, that's increased. Uh, again, it takes uh, uh, w whether they can do it faster or cheaper than us. Uh, is uh, that's why I say our levers and our ability to be able to deliver has to has to speed up, and our processes have to get faster with the times. What type of weapons are they uh, sending into our hemisphere? Fighter aircraft, uh, helicopters, um, air defense systems, uh, small arms vehicles. So Southcom has had an office that supports trade and investment and works to connect small businesses in the region. How is that doing? Uh, the, in terms of the small business, we had the small business director uh, actually uh, attend the Chile inauguration for the president. Uh, and in terms of small business, I'll, I'll tell you what I've done, Senator, is the, uh, we were able to bring Benz, which is the business executives for national security. Uh, who coordinated a trip into Panama in October with 10 CEOs. Uh, and I just took the out brief uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, organized under my predecessor. And then just seeing the value of getting that perspective on the ground, because when you talk about the investment levels uh, that, that the PRC has when they go into these countries with over $50 billion in five years across the AOR, uh, I'm looking at OPM, other people's money. How can we get investment in the region uh, to help with the economic problems that these countries are having? All right. Thank both of you for your service. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, General Van Herc and uh, General Richardson, for being here today. We really do appreciate your service to our country. And uh, you both are acutely aware of our adversaries and, and how they are actively spreading their economic and military influence beyond their borders to our own doorstep. This is right here, as uh, your predecessor, Admiral Fowler, used to say, in our own neighborhood. And that's such a great way to phrase that because they are there right here. Uh, China in particular is on the offensive here in the Western Hemisphere. And there are days that I, I truly worry that our posture uh, remains very reactive at best and on certain days weak at worst. And that's, that's not due to you. It's because uh, we have many, whether it stems all the way from Pennsylvania Avenue all the way here, uh, we just don't give enough attention to our own neighborhood. Many of my colleagues have already stated that. Um, so I think it's imperative that we must give you all the tools that you need to have at your fingertips, the authorities, uh, making sure that they are flexible. But we also need realists in the DOD policy shop and at the State Department that will actually acknowledge the significance of a great power threat that is emanating through our area. Um, so General Richardson, I know that Senator Cotton focused very heavily on the Panama Canal. Um, I had a line of questioning as well in that area. I'm going to skip over quite a bit of that, but um, just for everyone's information, I think last year there were about 14,000 transits through the Panama Canal, and the United States is the number one user of the Panama Canal. And 60% of what goes through the Panama Canal, it either originates in the United States or is headed to the United States. And of course, I come from a very ag-heavy state. Um, a lot of those commodities or products uh, do transit through uh, the Panama Canal. So it is extremely important for us. Um, so if we could just hammer down just a little bit more, just very briefly, General Ritz Richardson, if you could talk about what you see going on around the Panama Canal with the Chinese influence that exists there. 
So thank you, Senator. And uh, certainly, I'd like to highlight that our country does $740 billion in trade with Latin America and the Caribbean. It's huge. And so uh, the importance of keeping that, uh, the Panama Canal open and free and uh, for global economics and the economies, not just the war plans, which I, uh, I worry about as well. Uh, is extremely important. But the strategic way of the investments and the proximity and the continued investment with other projects that they make uh, in and around the Panama Canal is very concerning. And so uh, six billion additional in, in addition to the, <clears throat> on either side of the canal, having state-owned enterprise uh, companies uh, along the canal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is very concerning. Uh, about a week or so prior to the Benz Group and Joe Votel's Benz Group going into uh, Panama, I had traveled there with a group of other congressmen um, to just really see the Chinese influence that is on the ground there, and it is extremely concerning. That's why I'm so thankful that the Benz Group is engaging in uh, Central America, in Panama, and other regions. We do need that economic economic uh, support in that region so that we can also be a good partner. And if there are ways that uh, the United States maybe won't invest, if we can find other allies and partners that do have uh, the type of supports that might be necessary in that area, I think that we should facilitate where we can. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit on the mining activities that occur in South America as well. Um, this is an area where we have seen a number of businesses from the United States attempt to get into places like Chile, um, where they have lithium resources. But who beat us to the punch? The Chinese. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about mining activities and, and how valuable that would be to the United States if we were able to engage in those types of activities. So the, the region is just rich with, um, with rare earth minerals. And as you, you talked about, I mean, I just took my granddaughter to the, um, uh, the History Museum on the Mall uh, a couple of weeks ago and got to see... Uh, just all the uh, uh, minerals and the uh, precious metals and things like that, resources from the region, uh, you know, the rubies, the emeralds, all of those kinds of things. But when you talk about illegal mining, it's illegal mining, it's illegal logging, it's illegal fishing uh, that happens. Um, if I, I know you asked about mining, but uh, if I could mention the fishing, at, at any given day, uh, I have over 600 PRC uh, fishing vessels in my AOR that are off the coasts of uh, Ecuador, Peru, uh, Chile, and they follow the fishing migration patterns. And so you know where they're going to be by the migration of the fish. And this is about three billion in lost uh, economics, you know, productivity that those nations desperately need that the Chinese are, are taking away. And so it's, it's, it's all three of those things that are extremely prevalent in uh, this AOR. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. I'm glad you brought up all of those other resources. Um, it's just incredibly important that we pay attention to our own neighborhood. And not only through our military, but also through our State Department, but also economically as well. So I really appreciate your presence here today. Um, thank you, General Van Herk, and thank you so much, General Richardson, and I yield. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. And Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to you both for being here. Thank you to your, for your service to our country. General Van Herk, let me start with you, and let me say it's great to see a fellow Missourian here, as always. Um, I noticed something you said in your opening statement. I want to quote it to make sure I get it correct. You said, I think, that uh, our reliance, America's reliance, on deterrence by cost imposition is currently overweighted and significantly increases the risk of miscalculation by limiting our national leaders' options following an attack. That caught my attention because I have been arguing for a while now about the importance of adopting a strategy of, of denial, deterrence by denial, versus deterrence by cost, cost of position, especially as it relates to China. So I wonder if you could just expand on your comments a little bit and tell us why you think it's important to end an over-reliance on deterrence by cost imposition. Thanks, Senator. First, first I would say uh, cost imposition. The nuclear deterrent is the foundation of homeland defense, and we must 
fully fund a triad. That is the foundation. We also must have a strong conventional force, but that has to also be balanced with deterrence by denial. And deterrence by denial is the capability to deny a potential adversary the ability to believe they can inflict damage on us that may bring us to our knees. And it's the ability to demonstrate readiness, resiliency across the whole of government, responsiveness. We do this every day with hurricanes, wildfires. We've demonstrated it with allies welcome. All of those contribute to the overarching integrated deterrence. That's where my campaign plan is focused. I don't want to start with defense kinetically in the homeland. I want to keep us out of a crisis and conflict by focusing on that deterrence by denial on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me ask you this. When, when you say that uh, one, of the, one of the dangers of over-relying on deterrence by cost of position is that it increases the risk of miscalculation and limits options, can you just explain that piece of it? Ab absolutely. So w without um, the d deterrence by denial and the belief in a potential adversary's mind that they can't be successful. They may actually believe that uh, because the homeland is vulnerable and they could bring us to our knees, that that may be the emboldening factor that uh, leads them to make a decision to attack, whether that be in Taiwan or another place, because they believe that they can disrupt, delay, or destroy our will in the homeland. We want to create the uh, them to believe and understand that we have the capability that they could never do that to us by defending the key critical infrastructure and having the resiliency and readiness to respond. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, let me uh, shift to um, the situation involving the drug uh, supply at the southern border and, and particularly fentanyl, which is in um, our state. Uh, absolutely devastating, and we're seeing mass quantities of it. Can you just give us an update on NORTHCOM's efforts to help DHS stem the flow of, of illegal drugs, and particularly fentanyl there at the southern border? Senator, currently NORTHCOM's providing about 2,450 uh, guardsmen from various states in a Title X status doing detection and monitoring, intel analysis, and also aviation support. Uh, the, the request for support for FY23 is in the department as well, and uh, being adjudicated at the department level, I don't have a tasking yet for 23. Let me ask you about the Mexican government. Have they been helping with this, with the, the flow of drugs, the human trafficking? Uh, has, the, has it gotten better or worse in the last year? Hey, the Mexicans are extremely good partners. I have great relationships with General Sandoval of Sedena, with Admiral Ojeda of Samar. Both are coming to visit me next month. They have tens of thousands of Mexican troops conducting the mission to support what we need with the common objectives. And, and we're very grateful for their partnership. What are you looking for them to do in the year ahead? Continue to partner, provide additional security. Uh, Samar has port security now. Uh, for fentanyl, that's crucial because those precursors often come into ports. Uh, would like to work additional information sharing to enable them to be more successful in interdicting much of those precursor chemicals that come into Mexico. Very good. Let me uh, shift back to China here quickly in my, my little bit of remaining time. Um, you mentioned Taiwan a second ago. It's no secret Beijing would love to seize Taiwan. They'd love to execute a fait accompli uh, with regard to Taiwan. And we also know that if they attempted to do that, they would seek to prevent us from deploying forces from uh, the West Coast into the theater. Tell me about your concerns about China's ability to strike military targets, targets in the homeland using cyber capabilities. Well, China possesses uh, extensive cyber capabilities. Uh, those responsibilities to defend the homeland primarily reside with CISA, uh, Director Easterly, and General Nakasone on the Doden side. My role is to provide defense support of civil authorities in the case of municipalities, industry, ask for support. Um, we, we have a, a good capability. What we don't know, Senator, is the unknown. We don't know where the vulnerabilities are because of the way we're set up across multiple agencies, across multiple industries, that we rely on volunteering their information for uh, cyber vulnerabilities. Got it. Thank you both uh, for your service again. General Richardson, I'll give you a few questions uh, for the record. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Rosen, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would really like to thank Generals Richardson and, and Van Herk for testifying today and for your service to our country. Thank you. 
Um, I want to speak a little bit about Iran's presence in the Western Hemisphere. And General Richardson, during your confirmation hearing, uh, we discussed Iran's presence in Latin America through its proxy Hezbollah. Its involvement in the tri-border region of Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, and its exchange of arms for oil with, of course, Venezuela. Over a year ago, Brazilian authorities extradited a leading Hezbollah financer to Paraguay, which dealt a blow, of course, to the terrorist group. However, we don't often receive the same support in combating Iran or its proxy activities from other countries in the region. Just a little over two months ago, Iranian official Mohsen uh, Mohsen Rezi was wanted by Interpol for his role as leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in the 1994 AMIA Jewish Community Center bombing in Argentina. He made an appearance at the inauguration of Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. To hold Iran accountable and Hezbollah accountable for their activities in Latin America, Senator Blackburn and I introduced the Hezbollah and Latin American Account uh, Latin America, excuse me, Accountability Act. So, General. Could you please update uh, the committee on Hezbollah's recent activity in Latin America? Are we effectively disrupting their agenda? And uh, to your knowledge, is Hezbollah continuing to exchange arms for oil with Venezuela? So th thank you for the question, Senator. And I think the, uh, quite honestly, thank you for the, for the act and the, um, and the work that we do partnering with our partner nations is so important through the security cooperation, uh, train and equip triple three funding. That's my main lever to work with these uh, militaries and these defense forces to counter our competitors and counter our threats in the region. And just as you listed off, you know what uh, what Iran does and has done uh, in our in our uh, in my AOR uh, is very concerning. And obviously. Um, to impact that, and when I, uh, Secretary of uh, Defense uses the integrated deterrence, and, and as I look at that, and you partner with all of the capabilities that are in the region, uh, it's so important that the partner nations that are dealing with this internally be able to have the capacity and capability to do that too. Um, I just request that I'm able to continue with that triple three funding so I am there because they want to partner with us. Mm -hmm. They want to partner. They look to us. They look for help. They look for assistance. They look for coaching, teaching, mentoring. Uh, they want to come to our schools. And this is how we make them stronger to handle their own, uh, the, their issues internally as we work together to counter the threats. Thank you. I want to uh, continue on this line of question, questioning because we know there's also uh, Chinese surveillance technology um, in South America. And so I asked you at the confirmation hearing about uh, um, Chinese state companies deploying that smart city, safe city technology in Latin America. And of course, uh, you said countries don't, don't like that in the region. So um, I'm concerned about the national security ramifications of this. So I know I have a short time left, but can you provide us an update on the countries who are trying to get rid of the technology implemented in their countries by China? And uh, what can we do to help uh, stop this widespread um, Chinese surveillance? So we do our best. I mean, not just the uh, DOD, but, uh, but also Department of State as we consistently work with them. I, senior defense officials and my senior co uh, uh, cooperation uh, officials that are downrange that are actually embedded in the embassies and working with our partner nations to advise them ab about the technology, the surveillance technology, a backdoor of getting into the defense networks and things like that. Certainly uh, the possibility of 5G and if, if nations get 5G, then our inability to be able to continue to work with them because of that cyber threat. Thank you. I want to kind of keep on the cyber threat, and I move over to General Van Herc about missile defense cybersecurity. Uh, as MDA works to rapidly deploy missile defense systems to stay ahead of threats, I'm concerned that we might not be taking potential cyber vulnerabilities seriously enough before fielding new systems. So in the 2019 Missile Defense Review, uh, software is mentioned, software's mentioned only once. This is a key way the hackers get in. Even more alarming, GAO's May 2021 reports highlights that none, none of MDA's 17 operational cybersecurity tests planned for fiscal year 2020 were conducted, and that cybersecurity testing since 2017 has revealed vulnerabilities. I will take I, my answer off the record, but uh, um, I'd just like to know what steps NORAD is taking to address the cybersecurity vulnerabilities. I, 
I see my time is up, so uh, I'll yield to my next question. We'll take it for the record. Thank you. Thank you both generals. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Tupperville, please. Good morning. Save the best for last. <laughs> Glad to see y'all. Uh, General Van Herrick, uh, we're here in Title 42 is going to expire March the 30th. Are we prepared for it? I would defer to the DHS. That's their mission. We, we are uh, actively planning based at the request of DHS. I don't have a task to do that at this time, mm -hmm. uh, but I understand the department is working through that with DHS. One of my favorite movies is, what, I think, We Were Soldiers. Mel Gibson uh, played Colonel Hal Moore, who was a friend of mine a few years ago and since passed away. Uh, in that movie, they're getting run over, and the code was Broken Arrow. In other words, they're up there on top of us. I saw a Facebook page this morning from, from uh, Border Patrol hollering Broken Arrow. We got huge problems, and I know we got huge problems all over the world, but it doesn't seem like we're addressing this enough. And we're going to have to sooner or later because it's really going to affect, and it is affecting our country as we speak, but with the drugs and all that. But just wanted to bring that up. Hey, given your 3,200 hours of flight time, you've flown about everything, I guess. Is there anything you haven't flown? There's plenty. I haven't flown what General Richardson flies, helicopters. <laughs> uh, a former Thunderbird Squadron Commander, J.V. Venable, recently wrote that a fighter pilot needs at least 200 hours a year or four sorties a week. In coaching, we call it practice. Uh, but the Air Force and Navy flight hours have fallen to historic lows. Is that concerning? From a readiness perspective, from somebody who receives forces from the service, it is concerning to ensure that every force that we receive is ready to execute the missions that I'm tasked to do best uh, answered by the services specific to their actual training, but it, it would be concerning if the trend continues to drop on the flight hours. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit Mr. Venable's report on Air Force uh, readiness and a Wall Street Journal article that references his assessment for the record, please. Without objection. Uh, General Richardson, uh, last week I met with a Columbia ambassador. Good guy. Uh, uh, they're huge allies. What inroads have you made down there? What relationships have you made? Because we've got, uh, even from my state, we've got a lot of input down in what goes on in Colombia, you know, with their business dealings, minerals, those things. What, what have you, what have you seen from Colombia? Uh, our number one security partner, uh, and I look to them as like a key linchpin to the security and the stability of the region. Quite honestly, uh, if you just look over, you. It's really hard in this AOR to take a snapshot in time of, of, of a country, but if you look for when, when they, uh, in 1999 and where they were then to where they are now, uh, it's just really tremendous. I have the Chief of Defense, uh, General Navarro, visiting on Monday. Uh, we had our staff talks, uh, Southcom, Columbia uh, staff talks in January. Uh, we have that was first country I visited uh, in the AOR um, when I uh, came into command of Southcom. So uh, our relationship is excellent. It's strong. It's uh, we share information. We're constantly communicating. Again, it's coaching, teaching, mentoring. I, I look at our partners. I mean, they're there on the ground. They see the threats. They're dealing with the threats every day. We have to have those good relationships with them. Uh, in order to increase our domain awareness, to make up for what I don't have in domain awareness and ISR and things like that. But the partnership gets you the trust and the access and the presence with your partner nation. It's obviously going to be a big key for us you know, in your AOR. But uh, thanks to you all. Uh, I'll cut my time short. Uh, I yield. Thank you very much, Senator Tuberville. Senator Le Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <clears throat> General Van Herc and General Richardson, thank you for being here today. You know, yesterday, I held a uh, hearing in this committee's panel on emerging threats to focus on how our military can work with our partner nations to improve security conditions in our hemisphere that in turn impact the U.S. border and our national security. Throughout South and Central America, criminal elements, China and Russia, are seeking to destabilize the region for their own gain. This is a national security challenge, and we need to treat it as a national security challenge. With that context in mind, 
I would like to touch on NORTHCOM's first, NORTHCOM's mission at the southwest border. Uh, the National Guard plays a critical role in this mission, providing much needed relief to overstretched Border Patrol agents and local law enforcement. I've been to the border um, many times, and I stay in close contact with local elected leaders and law enforcement. I've also delivered additional federal resources. And the, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Hemispheric Affairs committed to me earlier this year that National Guard troops would be well-resourced during these missions. So, General Van Herc, uh, in your view, is the National Guard's border mission properly resourced to significantly assist in addressing the crisis at the border? Senator, first, I share your assessment of the national security imperative, a challenge for us with what's going on at the border. Uh, the National Guard forces that are working for us in a Title 10 status are not only resourced by DOD, but they're provided resources by DHS. And, and my assessment is, for the most part, they're resourced to where they need to be. Uh, they could have additional resources uh, for observation, detection, and monitoring of those kinds of things from DHS. I, I think long term, this is not an enduring mission of the Department of Defense. Uh, we need to fully fund and resource DHS to do their mission. Uh, and uh, the DOD should be used in extremist times for the uh, support on the border mission. I'd like to just make sure that our mission is understood. We're not there enforcing the laws that DHS can do. We're supporting them to free up capacity so they can do th that mission. Uh, and we provide support, detection and monitoring, aviation support to help them, and also the intel analysis. Well, until DHS is fully resourced to do this, let's make sure that uh, the Guard and Reserve have the resources they need in their interim there. Um, General, are you in regular communication with uh, CBP, with Customs and Border Protection, and local law enforcement partners on this issue? Me personally, uh, uh, yes, not, not uh, daily or anything like that. I've been to the border multiple times. I was at the border last uh, month as well and met with both uh, the Customs and Border Patrol agents and discussed. We had eight in the room as well. I visited in your, uh, your state as well, in the Gallus, and been to the border. Uh, so we do that. I have multiple liaisons from 40 government agencies that work in my headquarters to include from DHS and the border. Well, that, that, that's good to hear. We need to, uh, you know, this is a comprehensive and challenging problem, and we need to all have uh, all agencies working together uh, to try to deal with this crisis. <clears throat> um, General Richardson. Um, in your posture statement, you mention the insecurity and instability that's been exacerbated by COVID-19. You know, we know that transnational criminal organizations routinely exploit poverty, instability, and corruption to gain political and criminal power. This is bad for stability. It's bad for our partners who are trying to sustain democratic societies, and it's bad for our own interests. Um, when we spoke earlier this week, you specifically mentioned that criminal organizations are using the instability brought about by the economic impacts of COVID-19 to create a wedge that Russia and China are taking advantage of. Can you elaborate on the relationship between Russia, China, and criminal organizations in the region, and how does the instability caused by criminal groups and opportunism of countries like China allow them to expand their reach? So overall, Senator, I just look at the, uh, the insecurity and instability, the cycle of vicious threats, this wedge that the TCOs can uh, create, which allows the, uh, our competitors, you know, the PRC and Russia, to flourish and look like the, the heroes of the day, right, when they come in with their projects and their money and, or equipment and capability and things like that. And so, uh, and uh, as we talked about as well, uh, the Chinese money launderers that uh, take the money from these TCOs, when these TCOs have all this cash, uh, huge, $310 billion a year annual revenue, uh, and move it back and turn it around into goods that they, that they uh, send back for the TCOs to be able to sell. And it's all cleaned, cleaned uh, money, if you will. Um, and so we have to, uh, you know, this isn't just a, uh, a, a DOD or a DHS. We also have to 
I think, get after this money. And, uh, and in terms of what uh, our whole of government approach is to follow the money and then be able to crack down. But I know that it's very difficult. These are complex cases uh, that Treasury and Justice have to deal with. Uh, but until I think we get it out, we get out, we, we get after that specific problem. We can't interdict our way out of this. We're not going to be able to do that. We got to go after and follow the money. Well, um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for the comprehensive answers from our phone call the other day that your staff sent sent over. I really appreciate that, and uh, and uh, those were really uh, helpful. I also want to make sure that you have the resources, you know, that you need to, to tackle this challenge. So I'm interested to see, you know, what the president's budget looks like um, for uh, for Southcom, Northcom as well. Um, and since I'm um, over, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I have uh, some uh, additional questions for the record. Thank you very much, Senator Kelly, and let me thank you, General Van Herk and General Richardson, for your thoughtful and very, very responsive testimony. Uh, at this juncture, I will adjourn the open hearing, and we will reconvene at 11.45, approximately 15 minutes, in SVC 217 for a closed session. Thank you very much.